Okay, so yes, my name is Mary Ford and I have been working um, at Haycastle since about 2015. I came on to write the uh, activities plan um, as we were applying for a large um, heritage lottery grant. Um, I can't get my mouth around National Lottery Heritage Fund, so I'm always going to say HLF, be there forever. Um, so let's have a look. Um, Hay Castle, right in the middle of Hay on Wye, not too far from here, um, a site that has been in private hands uh, for probably uh, over 900 years. <laughs> so this was something that we wanted to change. And when the castle was put on the market in 2011, when the previous owner, uh, King Richard Booth, as we like to refer to him in Hay, he decided to sell the castle and a group of local people got together because they didn't want to see the castle going back into private hands. So a charity was formed, Hay Castle Trust. Um, the castle was purchased thanks to a very generous donation. And then in 2016, we were finally successful in getting our just under 5 million HLF grant. Um, things are never that easy, went from that to getting all the planning permission and everything in place, um, and building work finally began in 2018. Uh, COVID came along, there were a few delays caused by Brexit, and we finally opened to the public this year at the end of May for the Hay Festival. Uh, we weren't quite ready. <laughs> it takes a very long time to do a project like this, and we had a small, minuscule closure again in September to finish what they call the snagging list, which makes it sound really small, <laughs> but it's not. It was quite important things to get done. Um, so anybody that knew the castle before, and I know I'd shown a couple of people here around before, um, we had a building that was in a very sad state. Um, it is a grade one listed and a scheduled ancient monument because we have the, the Norman section here that you can see with the uh, tower and then a Jacobean mansion added to it. We also had a very beautiful gate that we knew not very much about um, and the whole place really hadn't had a huge amount of research done on it. Um, so this project was an opportunity to do archaeology and research and um, some reports into it as part of the general big building project. Um, it really was in a very sad state because of uh, after surviving nearly 800 years of battles and warfare and trebuchets being thrown at it and all kinds of things, it was the 20th century that did the most damage. We had a uh, a terrible, disastrous fire in 1939. Uh, it happened at the end of April 1939, and the owner at the time happened to be a Mr. Lowell Guinness, who then went off to fly Spitfires and Hurricanes in the Second World War. So I think just forgot that he owned it. Uh, he had it as a fishing lodge, because you got three miles of the south bank of the Wye with the castle. Uh, and so the section that burnt in 39 had been left since then with no roof on it in a terrible state. Um, King Richard, bless his heart, um, also had another fire. <laughs> and after declaring himself king in, on April the 1st, 1977, uh, he had a very uh, sad day in which his uncle died. He ended up in the pub. And that night, slightly inebriated, a log came out of a fire and the other side of the castle burnt down. So not lucky in the 20th century. So that's what we were dealing with on the site. We basically got a site that had not been well looked after um, and desperately needed some care. So getting, we received just under 5 million from the HLF and then about 2 million in match funding ourselves from a variety of different places. Um, and the project, uh, gave the opportunity to do quite a lot of archaeology. I'm not an archaeologist myself. I'm a very frustrated uh, want-to-be archaeologist, so I spent a lot of time pestering our two archaeologists, um, Peter Dawling and Di Williams, asking them what they were doing, why they were doing it, what that was, why are you doing it like that? Um, uh, so they're probably absolutely glad to get rid of me. <laughs> Um, so we uh, were able to undertake five structural engineering test pits in advance of the planning and the listed building consent. 
And then once the building consent was in place, we had a 10 further test pits, which we called phase two. And then phase three was a very large soak away pit and some archeology span on the front terraces. Um, and then on top of all of that, there was a watching brief during the groundworks when the builders came in. So that gave us quite a good uh, opportunity a lot of the test pits were looking at foundations, so they were along the um, outline of the building. There wasn't any major work done on the lawns, and that becomes quite important um, later on. Okay, so these, when, when you speak to um, Peter or Di, uh, it's actually quite slightly disappointing the amount of fines that we had considering the site. Um, and that is probably because of the amount of um, earthwork that has happened um, in more recent times. But these are just a little example of some of the things that we were found and uh, shows my enthusiasm for the project as well because they're all me holding them going, oh, can I take a picture of that? <laughs> so the first find that we've got here is a Civil War musket cap. So this is made of lead and is a replacement, apparently, for when a, a powder cap had lost its lid, so they'd make a quick one out of lead. And that was found just between the Norman keep and the, the slightly newer Jacobean mansion. We then have a beautiful piece of glass, which also features in the lower photograph here. This was found in the tower, and is actually um, thought to be Venetian glass from the 16th or 17th century. So very interesting in what it tells us about the status and wealth of the people that were living there at the time. Um, the next one is a very beautiful little Norman head. Um, this one actually didn't even require any digging or anything. It was lying face down on the floor and Peter picked it up and went, oh look, there's a face on there. <laughs> So astounding that it had been there for so long and nobody noticed it before. Uh, we think that is um, probably Norman. Uh, the next one is a glass bottle that was discovered in the tower. Um, I'll come back to the tower in a later slide, but these glass bottles were in a wine cellar that had been constructed inside the bottom of the Norman Tower. Um, they were found in very funny uh, in a very funny situation because this wine cellar is a was a vaulted brick wine cellar and after long discussions um, in our conservation steering group which involved uh, the parks, CADU, Royal Commission, Paris, um, everybody in there talking about it, that we came to the conclusion that we would remove this wine cellar as um, it wasn't a particularly great example of a wine cellar. It had been condemned. It was very, very dangerous. No one could go down inside it. And it was more important for the project and for the building to um, allow people to visit the, the bottom of the Norman Tower. So the wine cellar was removed. And when the archaeologists went in to do a 3D survey and photograph it, they discovered these wine bottles stuck behind one of the arches. So they'd been kind of secreted behind one of the arches. So we came to the conclusion that a butler had probably been going in the wine cellar, <laughs> having a little tipple of the very, very classy wine, and then hiding the evidence. And one of the bottles actually had a seal with uh, the name of, um, I think it was Richard or Henry Wellington on it and that dates from the 18th century. So 18th century wine bottles. Some of them were corked, and I got very excited because I thought, oh, we might get to taste some really old wine, but unfortunately they were all empty. Um, the bottom middle photograph is one of my favorites. Now, this is a trebuchet ball that was discovered when we did excavations um, in the east side of the mansion just next to the Norman Tower. And there's a very complex little area there that would have been underneath the stairs in the Jacobean Mansion. But actually, in the excavations that we did, we discovered this new history to the castle that we hadn't known before, which I will come back to. But this little friend here was discovered, slotted between some Norman masonry and some later Tudor masonry, and uh, appears to be a trebuchet ball that was probably fired at the castle 
in the Barons' War of the 1260s. Um, similar balls have been found at Drisloin, I believe. There's about seven that were found at Drisloin. It's about 29 centimetres in width and about 29 kilos in weight, um, and very similar to the ones at Drisloin, and not at all similar to the ones at Kenilworth and Warwick. So we think probably more to do with those um, that time then. Um, it's a fantastic artefact. It's now on display in the castle. If anyone goes there and they see it, um, you can feed back to me on whether you think that's the correct position for it. I've already tainted that because I don't think it is. <laughs> it's been put in a position in the tower by a broken down corner of the tower, which makes it look as if it's caused that bit of breakage on the tower, which actually happened in the 19th century. Personally, I think it should be in the main hall. Um, it's a star object to me. It's something that um, children find really, really good to engage with. And there's lots of activities that you can do around trebuchets. He's even got a name because I took him into the local primary school. So this is Colin. <laughs> <laughs> and it's brilliant showing the children as well because they can feel how heavy it is. And there's all kinds of things. It works really well. So uh, if anyone visits and they'd like to fill in a comic card and say where they think Colin should be, I'd appreciate that. Um, the last item there is a little token that was found, and this is another really frustrating thing for me, because this was actually found by our site manager, Adrian, and he loved um, having, looking around the castle. He worked for Weavers, who did all of our... John Weavers construction did the building work, and he discovered that on the top of the portcullis. And he was just wandering around looking at the mortar that they were meant to be doing and he found it on the floor. And it's actually a 17th century token with the name Matthew Parry on it. Dates from 1636, I believe. So he also just found that on the floor and picked it up. Hugely frustrating to me because I've never found anything. <laughs> I've worked there for a very long time. So that's a couple of the finds. Um, these will all be detailed in the report that... Um, Peter Dawling um, is submitting on the project because he, like me, had been involved since about 2014, 2015. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Now, this is a part of the archaeology that I found incredibly exciting. Um, and this was the discovery. So looking at this old postcard of the castle, um, you can see where the red dot is marked. We did a, a test pit there to look at the foundations of the tower. Now, we previously had no idea that this tower had, could possibly have been a gateway tower, but the archaeology at that spot immediately revealed a column of tufa, um, and Alan would be able to give you much more details about tufa, but I believe it's a form of limestone. It's a very bright white when you first build with it, and it's much easier to cut, so the Romans and the Normans love building arches out of it. The discovery of this pillar of tufa uh, indicated to us that it had possibly had a tufa-lined gateway at the front. However, we only had the funding to dig the one test pit on the front. We couldn't afford to dig one on the other side, so we had to go with the assumption that this was part of a gateway. Um, and on the inside, because we had this brick lined cellar that I mentioned, we couldn't actually see the interior wall on the, on the inside of the castle. So we knew the town side had been rebuilt. And then on the inside, we had this really faint indication in that middle photograph that there could possibly be an arch there, but we couldn't prove it. Um, and the little drawings there are just um, some visualizations that the architects did as part of the whole um, application, thinking about how that might have worked if it had been a gateway tower in its very earliest form, and then how it was altered over time, and then a gatehouse was built at the side. So this little part of it was very exciting in that if we could prove that this is what had actually been there, as part of, um, I'm also involved in Hay History Group, and as part of our involvement with the Brecknock History Week, one year we decided to do our own community-based archaeology on 
the other side of this wall to see if we could find any indication of the arch on that side. So Peter came and volunteered with us uh, and helped um, community members do a dig and some children from the local school, but we couldn't find any indication on the arch on the exterior side. However, because we got permission to remove the wine cellar, which was an incredible job because as soon as the builders went in to try and remove some of the bricks, it actually started collapsing in on itself. So we had to remove it from above. So that's a view looking down. And you can see that we had to take all of the rubble out on this little conveyor belt up the only um, steps that we had there. So it, and there'd been a huge, thick um, floor of concrete put on top, which we think was done by the Ministry of Works in the 1950s. So there was quite a lot to deal with there. However, once they had done this, we were able to get down into the cellar and look at what was there. I was absolutely over the moon because as you can see in the other photograph, there is very definitely an arch there. So I was jumping up and down saying, yes, we've done it, we've proved it. This was the original gateway. This is the way people entered into the castle. However, anybody who knows their Norman uh, architecture will know that that arch is too late for the 12th century date of the building of the tower. I had no idea about this. I, <laughs> I just stood there getting very excited. But Will Davis, our CADO inspector, shook his head and said, that is not an arch that dates from the time that we think that this was built. This doesn't make sense. It's very confusing. What is going on? My head hurts. Um, as you can see in this photograph, where the um, measuring stick is, there's still a column of bricks there. So we asked John Weavers if they could remove that column of bricks as well, so we could have a look at the arch properly. And what you get then is this. So that is with the bricks removed. And lo and behold, when you look at this, and if you come to Hay Castle and do a tour, I can show you this in real time, um, here we actually have an arch of tufa. So it looks as if this castle had had this amazingly blingy tufa-lined entrance into the site, both on the town side and then when you got inside as well. Something obviously happened with it. I don't know whether the tufa was unstable, whether something had collapsed. And then a later arch has been built on the inside to, to keep it up. And then, at a much later time, the whole thing has been filled in and we have a gateway to the side. So this little bit of wall that is now down in our cellar tells us a huge amount about the history of this site. The large black hole in the middle we think is a coal hole and was also home to our one bat who caused about six months of delay, but we won't talk about him. Okay, so the gates. We have this beautiful set of gates that have for as long as I can remember, stood covered up. You see them from town in the market square. They used to have a fence in front of them and a large piece of oak propping them up because the gatehouse started getting very wobbly in the 90s. And Richard Booth phoned one of his friends and said, oh, just put something up there, will you? So it was propped up with a piece of oak. Um, no research had been done into these gates at all, so we knew nothing about them except for the fact that they're different. And one is very plain and has a wicket gate in it, and the other side is more intricate and latticed. But that is about as much as we knew. So the project with the gates involved removing them, which was quite a feat in itself. Um, this shows the amazing carpenters from John Nethercott and Co. who did the um, restoration on them. It took them seven hours to remove the lattice side, uh, so that was one day, and then they had to come back another day, and it took about four hours to remove the plain side because we think they've been closed since probably about 1700, not been used for a very long time, and were completely rusted on their pintles. Um, you can see from the other photograph quite how different they are. Um, the plain side was much easier to date, so we did dendrochronology, and that came back with a date of 1640. So this date to us makes total sense because that's when the main Jacobean mansion was built. 
So looks like they came along, wanted to build a big fancy house there. One side of the gate was very damaged or missing, so a carpenter was asked to replace the gate, and he did a not very good job <laughs> and didn't match the other side, which was much more complex. The other side, the lattice side, at the trust, we got very, very excited because we thought oh, we could have an original gate. It could date from the early 1200s, and then we could claim that we've got the oldest gate in Wales, and we'd beat Chepstow, because I think theirs is 1198, but it's not in the original position. It's been removed and is hanging elsewhere. So a bit of gate war started. Um, and then we couldn't get a dendro date from it, so we did carbon dating. And this shows the lovely gentleman from Oxford Archaeology taking the sample to do the carbon-14 dating. Um, what happened is, as you can see next to him there, we have a drawbar slot, and we had a cat called King, who was a Bengal cat, and he lived at the castle. He was horrible. He used to attack everyone. He bit me a few times, and his special party trick was to hide in the drawbar slot and jump out at people and bite them. <laughs> so this poor gentleman was doing his work and taking his sample, and King jumped out, had a go at him. He, King got booted away. And he thought, oh, drawbar slot. And he put his hand inside the drawbar slot and felt inside, and it's lined with wood. So he said, can I do a sample from that while I'm here? We said, yeah, absolutely. The date for the gate came back as 1328 to 1360, I believe, which makes it the oldest working defensive gate in Wales. So we can claim something. <laughs> it's very long-winded, but we can claim it because it's still in situ. The wood in the drawbar slot came back with a date of 917 to 957. So anyone that's been on one of my tours before where I point to the arched, tufa-lined window on the tower and say that's the oldest part of the castle, I was completely wrong because the oldest part of the castle is sitting hidden inside that drawbar slot. It brings up a whole new lot of questions about the site and a whole new lot of research that we need to do um, and is also very exciting. Uh, the other photograph shows the work being done on the gates um, in John Nethercott's um, workshop in Discoid um, and absolutely fantastic work that they did and it was a pleasure to talk to the carpenters about the job that they were doing and see their work. It's really lovely. Um, I will move on to the conundrum of the, uh, the main mansion. You can't see very well in here because of the white. Uh, that's a shot of the castle taken before any of the restoration work. It looks a lot better than that now. Um, and the two white lines, I think I'll move on to the next one. It shows it a bit easier. You can see from here what we lost in the 39 fire. So Richard Booth put the roof back on on this side but the roof had remained off on the 39 fire section, and so it looked like that since 39, and was actually in a really bad state because there was nothing holding the walls in anymore, so they were all trying to escape outwards. But what we discovered is that because there is this very odd kind of setback, you have the main mansion, and then you have this odd little setback section, which is at a very odd angle, to the Norman Tower, which we now know is a gatehouse tower. And we realized through the archeology span that what had actually happened is that after the site had ceased to be defensive, a certain gentleman called James Boyle, who became mayor of Hereford in the 1560s, discovered that he got a buy one, get one free deal. And that as mayor of Hereford, he also could claim to be Lord of Hay. He came down to Hay, there was obviously a ruined site here with some medieval masonry standing, and he decided to build a little mini Tudor mansion. And he knocked through three entrances into the tower, which was roofed at the time, and it was he who put in, so you can see there's a Tudor window on the lower end of the tower with the original Norman window above. So he put in Tudor windows, he put in fireplaces inside, and apparently this was quite the thing to do. It was very on vogue in Tudor times to go and do up uh, bits of medieval masonry. So he lived in this little mansion attached to the tower, and it was his granddaughter who married a certain um, Howell Gwynne, and they had the site, 
and Hal Gwynn had the cash to bring, build the big Jacobean mansion. So actually, the site has been just added to through time. And on the front side from town, you, there's hardly any indication at all of this little mini Tudor mansion. But if you look really closely, it used to be hidden by a drain pipe. There are corner stones that you can see that actually one house stopped and the Jacobean mansion has just very cleverly incorporated it. And you can see that from the archaeology inside. So um, we had amazing amounts of scaffolding up and we're able to take some really good photographs looking down onto the archaeology taking place. So you can see where we saw a little bit of Tudor wall here, but also um, uh, Peter and I discovered a possible latrine tower, a medieval tower there, adjoining the keep. And all of these different level changes, which have also given us um, an insight into the history of the site. I have got here... A, a dating plan, but very difficult to read on there. But you start with the curtain wall on the yellow on that side, go through to the tower, the gateway tower. Then you have the small, darker green Tudor mansion, the main Jacobean mansion, which incorporates some medieval masonry on a very thick wall with fireplaces in, and then a 17th century service wing, followed by a much later um, 1836 coach house. So... All of this work has given us the ability to work out the, the kind of um, run through time of the place as it's moved from east to west. Um, one of the things that I found really fascinating from it is what we've learned about the ground levels at the castle. So I don't have brilliant photographs to show you this, but this photograph taken not long ago, you can see all the leaves on the floor, you can see that the gatehouse and the tower are at a much lower level than the house. So the main Jacobean house is up at this level, and you've got almost a two-metre drop to go down to the level of the gatehouse, and the tower is actually at the same level as the gatehouse, so you go down to get into the tower. So this started raising questions about what had been going on here and why there was this level change. Now, it makes sense with a Jacobean mansion like this um, that is all about status and wealth. It's got the whopping great big chimneys, the gables, everything about it is, is telling you how wealthy this family is and what status they have. But where on earth did all the earth come from? And if they had upped the house to kind of look down on the people of Hay as they did... Um, where did it come from and why was there this change from the, from the original medieval site? And one of the other bits of archaeology that we did was what I like to call the swimming pool, which was a, when we actually dug it twice, we did a test pit because the architects decided that the best place for all of the drainage from the site was a soak away on the rear lawn. Um, and uh, it we, we'd done some geophys on the lawn, but it hadn't really come up with very much at all. So it was decided to dig a test pit. Uh, we got the big boys in, so the JCB came to dig it with Di and um, Peter there on a... Um, um, we started with trowels and <laughs> had a small, but it didn't take long to realise that actually we needed to go a bit deeper. And with the JCB, we actually got down to about 2.1 metres before we found anything that wasn't infill. Um, so it suggests to us that actually the whole medieval site, because we found lime and workings and all kinds of things at this 2.1 metres, it suggests to us that the Norman site was on this lower level. To me, and this is just my personal theory, if this had been a Morton Bailey site, once you'd come through the original gatehouse, there could possibly have been a mot inside where you would have had your traditional keep. Um, and if this was so, when the Gwynne family came to build their big mansion, that mot would have been blocking their view of the Black Mountains and probably wasn't what you wanted on your delicate lawns out the back. So if they'd flattened that mot, that would have given you this two metres infill in the back, 
and has also hidden all of our Norman archaeology under great depth. <laughs> so any pits that had been done on the back lawn and the geophys had not come up with anything because everything's actually so far underground. Um, so we did do a, a small pit with the Young Archaeologist Club at one point on the end of the lawn, but of course we can't go down to those depths in those kind of um, test pits, so we'd have to do a much dig, bigger dig again. So it's something that I'd really like to push for in the future so that we can try and find a little bit more about um, the Norman archaeology that we have on the site. Um, that's an aerial view that shows... So you've got the castle, you've got the keep here at the bottom. This is before the works, going through um, to the Jacobean mansion and then the coach houses and everything there. So we have got a little remnant of curtain wall on this side here, and we have found from the archaeology that it also ran along the front of the house and probably ran all the way around like that. And if there had been some kind of mop, would probably have been in this position here. And this is just a photograph to show um, what has happened in the last six years. Um, so you can see this quite sad building that desperately needed some love and a bit of looking after. Um, and then um, when we opened this May, June, um, the decision as well, it's very interesting to not do any contemporary interventions on the exterior. So there was a lot of conversation about this with the architects and the trust because from the exterior now, it actually looks exactly like photographs that were taken before the fire of 39. So the architects decided that they'd go with the original material, so it has stone tiles on the roof, rebuild the gables in the same stone with stonemasons doing them, and the only thing that's any different is actually right on the apex of the roof, we've put in big um, glass smoke um, windows, so that if there is a fire, because we are slightly worried about fires at Haycastle, um, then that will let all of the smoke out and also gives you a view of the beautiful chimneys. Um, on the inside, however, and I haven't got a photograph, so you're going to have to come and see, uh, it's a very different approach. So as soon as you walk in through the door, because we've lost all of those original features on the inside and had a burnt-out shell, we have a very modern and contemporary approach on the inside. So you'll have to come along and see. And I shall end there with a very lovely shot that the architect took, but you can't really see in this picture. But there you go. <laughs>